Hey everybody, Dr. Hinky here. Uh, here's our presentation for Lab 15 on evolution. I posted the lecture video on that, so this will um, follow along pretty closely. I think this lab is pretty straightforward. Uh, your study guide for this, the learning objectives, you should be able to summarize the five main types of evidence of evolution. Given a diagram, you should be able to identify major evolutionary events in history using the geological time scale. So we're looking at geological history. Uh, describe the placement of older versus younger fossils in rock layers. Given a diagram, you should be able to compare the forelimbs of different vertebrates and explain how comparative anatomy gives evidence of common ancestry and you should know the difference between homologous, analogous, and vestigial structures. You should be able to explain how developmental features provide evidence of evolution and common descent, uh, this is embryonic development. And when given a number of amino acid differences for a specific protein um, from different species, you should be able to determine the relatedness of the species. Uh, and you will compare and contrast the skull structures of Gorilla Gorilla, Australopithecus boisei, and Homo sapiens, um, and determine the relatedness of the three species. So what is evolution? When we're talking about evolution, we're talking about a change in the genetic makeup of a population over time. And the genetic makeup, these are small differences, a change in an allele, What's the allele frequency in this population now? What's the frequency of this allele at some time in the future? Does it change? Uh, and then the accumulation of these over time can lead to significant differences. A diverse gene pool is good for long-term survival of, of a species. That means genetic variation is important. Without genetic variation, every individual is suited to the same environment, so any change in the environment uh, could have adverse impacts on every single individual. So the big easy to see example of this is uh, a bacterial population. If all the bacterial were, if all the bacterial were exactly identical genetically, no variation, and they were all susceptible to an antibiotic, then I, when I gave that antibiotic, boom, they'd all be gone. That would be the end. No more evolution, no more bacteria, done. Um, but, but genetic variation means some individuals would not be susceptible and they would survive and pass on those genes for not being susceptible for antibiotic resistance to their offspring. So we need variation in a population. Um, so how do genetic variations occur? Where do we get them? Well, at the most basic level, first where they're all gonna start uh, is through mutation, random change to DNA. We might get those changes uh, from errors during mitosis or meiosis, making a copy in the S phase. Could be environmental damage that could change uh, our DNA. These are random, they just happen. It's an error that gets passed on. And also get these through sexual reproduction. So remember when we learned about meiosis, we get changes to our DNA in meiosis, um, not through a mutation, but through crossing over. We also get changes in which combinations of chromosomes get passed down in the gametes. So meiosis contributes to a lot of variation uh, as our precursor to sexual reproduction by creating lots of uh, variation within the gametes. And then sexual reproduction, we have a mixing of alleles from two different parents, from mom to dad, so we always get new combinations. Um, we get new arrangements of alleles in every individual offspring. So those new combinations of alleles give us new and different phenotypes, so lots and lots and lots of genetic variation uh, in every reproductive event. And we see genetic variation, particularly in populations of sexually reproducing organisms. So our evidence of evolution that we're gonna look at in this lab, the fossil record, comparative anatomy, comparative developmental features, embryonic development, 
comparative biochemistry, and biogeography. So first we're going to look at geological time scales and be able to analyze these events. And as we look at these geological time scales, this is kind of shifted, should be over a little bit. Um, the way they typically are positioned is if we would read here, we'll have here are the eras. The eras are the broadest category. And then epochs divide the eras into smaller segments. And then periods divide those. Um, in this image, what we see are different groups of organisms. And the thickness of this band, as we go from bottom to top, indicates what's happening to the numbers in that population. So, uh, and these are, our geological time scales are always structured with the most recent, right? So present day is at the top. And as we go down, it gets further and further back in time. That would be um, like digging down through the layers of sediment in the earth. As we dig deeper, uh, there are things that stir things up. It's not always exactly in order, um, but for the most part, as we go deeper, we get older. So here, I can look and see where a group of organisms arise. So I see the ammonoids arose sometime in the Triassic period. Uh, it looks like corresponds with Middle Triassic. Their numbers expanded. This gets wider and wider. Kind of their broadest point when they were most abundant would be sometime in the middle of the Jurassic. And then their numbers started to decline as we got toward the late Cretaceous. And then something happened, they just boom, disappeared. And if we look here, the late Cretaceous to the Paleocene, um, there seems to be, ooh, this big break where Lots of things. Look, this was never huge, this group, but all of a sudden narrowed down and then came back some. The echinoderms stayed pretty even. Um, those guys didn't die off till later, whatever they are, but here we have our uh, the lemnitids that, boom, they all suddenly went away. My ammonites went away and other things started to expand. The dinosaurs went bye-bye. They disappeared. So what happened here? Ooh, asteroid strike. We had a big, um, a big die-off. So we had a mass extinction event here, the mass extinction event. Um, and that mass where we are, okay, here we are up here, that mass is still up here. Um, we see lots of things died off, and by these, our dinosaurs were by far our most abundant group, and by them dying off, it allowed the expansion of mammals and a number of, of fish groups, the actinoterodigil. So this eliminated a lot of competition, let other groups expand. So we can see for this relative um, abundance over time. And we read these, this is the oldest at the bottom, the youngest at the top. Uh, geological time scales that are written as tables, written out like this, same structure, oldest at the bottom. Here we have millions of years ago, so this is current. 0.01 million years ago, 2.6, so MYA, millions of years ago. And this tells us what was going on, what happened. Here we see, oh, mass extinction. 50% of all species, dinosaurs and most reptiles, are wiped out. We have another mass extinction here between the Triassic and the Jurassic. 48% of all species are wiped out, including corals and ferns. Um, and then with that, right, so that mass extinction, most of them are wiped out. Not all, but it allowed flowering plants to appear. Uh, and our dinosaurs began to flourish in this period. So we can have a table form for this as well. Um, and 
hand. Oh, sorry, here we go. Uh, here we have uh, an image that we can see this is corresponding to going backwards in time as we dig deeper and deeper down to the Precambrian. And so this goes back um, 4.6 million years to the formation of the Earth, a billion years, sorry, formation of the Earth as we go down each layer. This gives us the name, and over here we see what organisms were abundant. Here's a fossil. These are related to spiders, scorpions, mites, horseshoe crabs. This is a trilobite, uh, and they are extinct now, but we could look down in the fossil record and find our trilobites to see when they were abundant. So our fossils are preserved remains of living things, and paleontology is the study of the fossil record. So you're going to study the fossil record. You're going to be paleontologists for part of this lab uh, and look at different invertebrate fossils. So here's a trilobite. Um, these are some soft corals. These are, there's a dragonfly. We have plant fossils. Uh, so we can compare and see what fossils were abundant in different areas based on how far down we dig them up. We have vertebrate fossils. We see the range of this dinosaur species. Shows where it was and this shows where it was found. And comparison of that gives you some idea of how big this bad boy was. Uh, uh, the fossil record is incomplete because not everything can be fossilized. You have to have a certain set of conditions um, to create a fossil. We we'll continue to discover new fossils. Uh, here's an early tetrapod. The Tictelic was a fish with tetrapod features. So a fish that, hey, look, we had fins that are kind of modified um, into walking, a walking structure. So this is a transitional fossil uh, as organisms move from the sea to become land animals. It's the first transitional specimen between fish and a land-dwelling tetrapod. Uh, and we start to see elbow-like features. Some more recent fossil discoveries. Australopithecus anamensis uh, is a 3.8 million year old nearly complete skull that's the uh, oldest known australopithecine species. This is a fairly close relative uh, to an upright, hum upright human transition to uh, Homo, to that uh, genus name. The, another recent find was a turtle femur with bone cancer. So cancer existed 240 million years ago. Uh, it's not a recent thing. It's been around. We've maybe exacerbated instances of it with some of our treatment of the environment, but it's been around. Cancer is a naturally occurring event. Um, for anybody who has not been to the College of Charleston Museum, Natural History Museum, they have a terrific, terrific museum. It's right on um, Calhoun Street. If you're driving by near Starbucks and look over to the right, go past Starbucks going toward uh, MUSC and Roper, you look over on the right, you'll see some of the, um, the fossils, but it's a great museum. So if you get a chance to go and visit when they're open, uh, do stop by there. You can see some examples of these fossils. Uh, some other activities you'll be doing in lab, comparing fossils from different strata, uh, kind, of, kind of get a timeline of when and where things were obviously older, more recent. Um, so you'll be comparing that to determine when things existed relative to other organisms. You'll look at comparative anatomy and look at homologous structures, which are anatomical structures that are similar in their physical construction because they come from a common ancestor. Even though they may now have different functions, because of different niches, because of different ways that organisms who possess this structure use them. Um, so these are homologous structures. They're similar internally, so we have similar bone structure, even though they look physically different on the outside, a bat's wing, a whale's fin, a cat's fore paw, and our 
arms um, because we use them for different things. So it shows a close evolutionary relationship. So they're used differently, but they are derived from a common ancestor and we've just modified our bone structure over time depending on what was most beneficial for our particular niche. We could also have analogous structures that are anatomical structures that are similar in function but don't come from a common ancestor. So they have different development, different anatomy. Uh, we look at the fins, tails, the sleek body shape between whales, dolphins, and sharks. This is an example of convergent evolution. They have the same problem. What's the most efficient way to swim? Well, this body shape and a fin structure. Mammals have a horizontal fin, stru fin structure. Fish have vertical, so they do differ. But they're using those fins and that body shape for the same thing, efficient hydrodynamics movement through water. So they're solving a similar problem with a similar solution. It's convergent evolution. They don't, do not come from a common ancestor. And then vestigial structures. These are remnants of structures that were function, functional at one point. So in ancestral species, they were functional, um, but as species, as populations diverged and became adapted to different environments, that was no longer functional in some. Um, so for example, whales have a pelvis and leg bones. They had some ancestor that walked on land. Uh, so in the case of whales, they had been a land mammal that returned to the sea and those vestigial structures tell us something about that. Snakes similarly have remains of a pelvis and leg bones um, that have now shrunk and reduced because they are no longer functional, but at one point in some ancestor, they had been. <clears throat> Our vestigial tail, the coccyx, those last three vertebrae, remnants of a tail from some long ago ancestor, a uh, cave, a blind cave fish. They don't really have a complete eye. They have a vestigial eye, this remnant of an eye. Uh, it's no longer on the surface, but you can still see it beneath those, uh, the, the outer scales. Uh, <clears throat> so here's an example. Is this homologous, analogous, or vestigial structure? What do you think? Well, there are different uses, flying, swimming, running, grasping, different shapes, different uses, but the bone structure, I have the same bones, slightly modified depending on, modified quite a bit in some cases. So these are pretty similar. This is quite distinct, but if I count those bones, I have the same bones across the board. So those are homologous structures. Uh, you will get a chance to compare some primate skeletons. These images of them. A chimp versus humans. We share 99% of our DNA. Um, so quite similar. And our bone structures, our skeletal structures are similar. And you know, look at these differences that have to do with the uh, the pelvis, we have a rounded versus vertical pelvis, arched feet versus flat feet, longer arms, uh, curved, uh, curved neck, all of these versus a straight, this straight vertebrae here, all of these are curved, slightly curved spine, all these have to do with a change in niche to walking upright to bipedalism. And here's our primate evolution and the relationships. And we see there was some ancestral common primate. This is not like if we were, if we were evolved from chimpanzees, they would no longer exist. There'd be a line from chimpanzee here to humans here. This is just so showing that we are cousins, right? We share some common great, 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 lots of great grandparent uh, 
um, so we didn't descend from them, but from a common ancestor. Uh, and here's some modern evolutionary history of humans, starting with early hominids. Here's our Australopithecus, in which we saw an example of an Australopithecine, that most recent um, and complete skull that was recovered. Uh, and over here we have modern humans. We have all of the precursor Homo genius, including Homo, Homo neanderthalensis. Um, and we can see these similarities in the skulls. Here we can see the timeline going oldest over here on the left toward the right, Holocene to the present. And we see that the Neanderthals, um, although they died out, wasn't that long ago, and we did overlap with them and with Homo floresiensis. Uh, and we have more evidence that we overlapped with Neanderthals because about 3% of our DNA and up to 8% in some individuals, uh, we carried Neanderthal DNA. So you'll compare uh, skulls from gorilla, australopithecus, from a gorilla, australopithecus, australopithecus um, and a human. Some of the things you'll look at are variations in teeth, uh, the size, the orientation, what those teeth look like um, in the chin and the jawline. And prognathism, prognathism, that's how far the bottom jaw sticks out. So in humans, this is um, the bottom jaw is directly below the top jaws, even with the face line versus an extended jaw sticking out. Um, does that lower jaw stick out beyond the vertical plane of the face? Uh, and the length, width, height, what's the size of the brain case? So you see this is a much smaller brain case than on this human skull. Uh, you'll also look at the sagittal crest, which is a strong, big protruding bone up here. Is it very high? Is it absent? Uh, and what that sagittal crest is for, that's where jaw, these jaw muscles would connect up here. Uh, and if you uh, have a big heavy jaw and you're um, chewing on very heavy, strong things, not nice cooked meals, you need stronger muscles, a stronger jaw. So those stronger muscles have to have some good strong attachment point. That's what the sagittal crest is for. <clears throat> Oh, uh, let's see. Whoops. There we go again. All right. Uh, you will also look at embryonic development. Um, <clears throat> the more similarities that are seen at the more stages throughout, as we look day by day um, over embryonic development, uh, how similar are these embryos over time? They're more similar through later stages of development if they are more closely related. So these are images from all the same um, the same time frame about uh, percentage wise of development. So if they're depending on what the terms of development are, how far along they are percentage wise in that term of development. These are all similar percentages. And we see lots of similarities between a mammal and a human. Longer tail, that's about it. Snakes, reptiles, birds. So the more similar, the more closely related. Our fish, our lamprey here is pretty different from the others. A little similar, but definitely more different than the others, more distinct. So you compare these, uh, here's a fish over time, salamander going to the same point in their development. And we can compare, we see very early on really similar. Here, turtle, chicken, human, more similar. Here we've gotten very dissimilar. There we get uh, some more significant differences than between these two. And then here, so we can see that progression of relatedness through that. Uh, then we'll also look at molecular comparisons. Now that we have the the tools to analyze on a molecular level. We can look at similarities in DNA or in RNA, our DNA codes for RNA. So we can look at either one for similarities and 
those produce proteins. So proteomics, we learned the study of proteins. I can look at my proteins. So here is cytochrome C. It's a protein that I can look at the amino acid sequence for this in a number of different organisms. Um, how similar is that sequence of amino acid? How many different amino acids are there in this sequence? So we have zero differences when we're comparing human to human, right? Because it's us, monkey to monkey. So this band here is self, right? We wouldn't have any differences with our own. Uh, monkey to human, we have one different amino acid. A rabbit compared to a human, nine different amino acids, only eight different from the monkey. That makes sense because only one different from human. So we can look at the number of differences to determine relatedness. The more differences uh, means the more time we've had for mutations or changes to the DNA to accumulate, meaning more distant relatedness. Here we can look at a protein structure, uh, comparative hemoglobin structure. What are the number of amino acid differences between hemoglobin in humans and these various other organisms? That tells us I can see further and further away uh, with relatedness. So for this lab, you will follow the checklist, look over the PowerPoint and watch the video, go to Top Hat and do the pre-lab questions, watch the videos, concepts, activities, uh, then do your virtual lab natural selection on antibiotic resistance, which I talked about a little bit in the lecture video. So if you need to go take a look at that uh, and then do your post lab questions in PowPath. All right, um, that is it on lab 15 and I will have lab 16 video uh, and chapter 16 and 17 video posted shortly. Bye-bye.